idea. You know, four minus four, yes, that's zero. But infinity minus infinity is not zero. Just for the, the same reason that infinity over infinity is not one, right? It's we don't know. Infinity minus infinity is also we don't know. We don't know, right? So who wins? Who do you think wins this? X cubed, right? The higher power. The higher power wins, right? This thing gets bigger faster than this one. But let's show it algebraically. It's a pretty simple thing to show. All I'm going to do here is factor. I'm going to just factor an x out, right? They both have an x. So if I pull an x out, I'm left with x squared minus 1, right? Now the whole idea of factoring is that you're turning something that used to be subtraction or addition into multiplication. See, now I have multiplication here, don't I? Now think about what happens. As x gets big, what does this become? Really big, right? Infinite times, now tell me about what's happening here. Big number squared, right? Take away 1. Still big, right? So now you have infinity, what, times? Times infinity. See, not minus anymore. Times. So what's a huge number times a huge number? A huge number, right? So by converting the subtraction into multiplication, you can determine that this thing is infinite, which, which means, of course, the same thing we thought would happen is that this x cubed dominates the x. The bigger, the bigger x gets, x cubed gets bigger faster than x gets big. Yes? OK, what about this one? Limit x goes to infinity. Uh, yes? It would be negative infinity, exactly, yes. So the question, if did, everyone didn't hear it, is what if these were flipped over? Okay, let's just do it. I'll just do it real quick. Okay, what if this was cubed here, right? You would still factor out an x, but now this would become 1 minus x squared, right? And now this goes to infinity, but this is 1, take away a huge number. That's negative, right? So this becomes negative infinity, and a, a positive infinity times a negative infinity should be a negative infinity. Because they're both huge numbers. One of them's positive, the other one's negative. Yeah? Good question. How about this one? How about the cube root of x squared minus the fourth root of x cubed? Who wins that battle? Let's first make sure we see there's a battle, right? X is going to infinity. Infinity squared, infinity. The cube root of infinity, still infinite, right? So we've got here infinity, take away, all right, infinity cubed, infinity, fourth root of infinity, still infinity. Infinity minus infinity, don't know, right? If this was a plus, what would our answer be? Infinity, we'd be done, right? Okay, but it's a minus, so. All right, shit. So it's not as easy as this one, right? This one we just factored out an x and we were ready, we were done. We're still gonna factor, but we have to figure out what to factor. You ready? Watch this first. I'm gonna rewrite this as x to what power? If I, if I wanna rewrite this from radicals to rationals, what is it? two-thirds minus x over here to the three-fourths. So if that does not ring a bell, we have a college algebra property here. If you take the nth root of x to the mth power, that's x to the m divided by n. That's the property from college algebra on how you go from radical notation to rational exponents or rational exponents back to radical. In, in calculus, Cal 1, Cal 2, Cal 3, this is our preferred notation for powers of x. We prefer this over this. You'll see why as we move on. All right, so hmm, over here, I just pulled the x out, right? Because we looked at it and we said, oh, they both have one factor of x, right? What do those both have in common? Hmm. Denominator of 12. Denominator of 12? Yeah. What do you mean? Negative 
12. Oh, so rewrite these as both having um, 12 in the denominator. So, okay, I, that's legal. I'll do it. Not sure if that's going to get us anywhere, but let's see if it works. So rewrite that with the 12. So I have to multiply top and bottom by 4, right? So 8, eight over 12 yeah. minus over here x to the here. I have to multiply top and bottom by 3. 9 over 12. Does everyone agree that that's the same thing? Okay, good. Now pull out x to the 8 twelfths. Pull out an x to the entire 8 twelfths. Yeah. So we're seeing here that this one has 8 twelfths, right? x to the 8 twelfths. This has 9 twelfths. What do they both have in common? 8 twelfths, right? So we're going to pull that out. So x to the 8 twelfths. Let's just think about what we would need in here to get back this. So I have to distribute through here. Wouldn't I need a 1 right here? Yeah. Right? A 1 would give me this. And then minus here, be real careful, you need x to the 1 twelfth. 1 twelfth. Why is it 1 twelfth? Because if you do x to the 8 twelfths, times x to the 1 12th, you add these two exponents, right? You add them, 1 12th and 8 12th is 9 twelfths. Does this work? Yeah. It should work, right? Because this is going to infinity, right? And then here, it's 1 minus, and then isn't that going to infinity as well? See, but now you have multiplication. And then this is infinity times these two together. What's these two together? Negative infinity. One take away a huge number. So you're multiplying a positive times a negative, so you're going to get negative infinity. So I guess the moral of the story is when you see infinity minus infinity, right, to be thinking factor, right, factor. See, maybe we can do one more of these. <laughs> uh, I think we're we're good. All right, I do have a, a few more I want us to look at though. How about this one? Limit x goes to infinity sine x over x. Now you might you might be like having these neurons fire where you're like, "Oh, the answer is 1." Remember that one I told everyone to memorize? Like, don't forget this very special limit. It was limit x goes to 0 sine x over x. And we said that this is always 1. This was the whole sine junk over junk, right? As long as the junk goes 0 and as long as, as the junk matches, your answer is always 1. Well, when we actually take this limit, we get sine of 0 is 0. And then over 0, we get 0 over 0 here, right? And you have to memorize this. This is not the same thing. This is n the same thing is not happening here, right? Just look at the denominator. x goes to infinity. Where does the bottom go? Infinity, right? The bottom's going to infinity, not 0, like over there. What about the top, though? This is the first time we've seen this sort of thing. Where is sine going as you go to infinity? It keeps oscillating, doesn't it? So I'm just going to draw for us just a real quick picture of what sine looks like. We should all know sine looks like this, right? So if we're asking ourselves, what's the limit as x goes to infinity of this sine function? Just the sine. Let's just look at just the sine. Then as we go out to the right, you cannot tell me that this function is headed to one particular place, right? It's not headed to 1. It's not headed to negative 1. It's not headed to any number in between because it's always oscillating, right? So we would say that this limit, what do you think we say? 
does not exist. Good, it does not exist. This limit does not exist, right? Does not exist. We have not seen this yet, have we? We've seen zero over zero. We've seen infinity over infinity. Those both required algebra or some trick. We have not seen something where the limit doesn't exist divided by infinity, right? We haven't seen that. However, however, we can still, we can still solve this, all right? So let me, let me do this kind of, let's just pause here and I want you to think about something for a minute. Do you agree with this? Sine of x Think back to pre-cal, right? We learned this in pre-cal. That sine of any angle, no matter what you plug in here for x, the smallest number you'd ever get is negative 1, and the biggest number you'd ever get is 1. So the sine function is bounded between these two numbers, right? So sine x, we would say here, is bounded, right? It's bound, bounded, sorry. It's bounded, right? It's a bounded function. There's a number that is always bigger than every value of sine, and there's a number that's always smaller. So it's like a ceiling and a floor, and it's, it's always between the ceiling and this floor, right? All right. You agree with that, yes? So this is, a, this is what we call a string of inequalities. You have something is less than or equal to something else, which is less than or equal to something else, right? So inequalities are kind of like equations. What you do to one side, you can do to the other. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to divide, divide everything here, all of them, by x. All right? So tell me if you're OK with that. There is an issue here. Can I do this? Is it legal for me to just divide by x, divide by x, divide by x? Well, that's OK so long as x is positive. Because do you remember what happens when you have inequalities? If you multiply an inequality by a negative or divide by a negative, what happens to the inequality? It flips, right? So like for example, if I'm, if I'm solving this inequality, negative x is, is less than 4. If I'm asking you to solve this, you can multiply both sides by negative 1, right? And if you do that, you get x is, this side's negative 4, but it does not stay less than, right? It becomes greater than. Do you remember that property of inequalities? If you multiply or divide both sides by a negative number, the inequalities flip. Here, I don't need to worry about flipping the inequalities because I'm going to put here to the side x bigger than 0. And the reason I can say that is because look over here. If I let x go to infinity, we're talking about positive numbers, aren't we? OK. So do you all agree with this statement? The first statement in blue was that the sine function was bounded. And the second thing I've done now is I've divided by everything, everything by a positive x, which means this in, these inequalities should be true, right? Right? So what we're saying is that this sine of x over x must always be less than or equal to that function. Think about the, that as a graph of a function, right? And it must be greater than or equal to this function. I'm going to graph this for you. I want you to actually see this. I'm going to graph 1 over x for you. Okay. And we're, this is 0. We're only going to be looking to the right because where are we letting x go? To infinity, right? To the right? Out to the right? That's 1 over x. This is negative 1 over x. See it? Let me see if I can get this a little bit different. I'm not quite sure this is doing what I want it to do. Hold on. I want to kind of exaggerate this. There we go. There we go. So the red is the, red is the 1 over x, right? And the blue is the negative 1 over x. And you can see that as you go out to the right, both of these get closer and closer to what? 0, right? They're getting 0. Which wouldn't we know that, like if I asked you right now to take the limit now? Like if I asked you right here, take the limit 
as x goes to infinity, right? Look at this right here. This is just a number over, over something that gets big, right? What do we say that always happens? Zero. That, right? This goes to zero. And then over here, if I take the limit of this one, right, as x goes to infinity, this should also, what, go to zero, right? Yes? yes? Which means that if I take the limit of this one, as x goes to infinity, if this function, sine of x over x, is always in between these two, then we're, if these two both go to zero, then this one has to also go to zero, doesn't it? I mean, think about it graphically. Sine of x over x has to live in between the red and blue functions there. Right? It has to be between them. I'm going to graph that one now. I'm going to graph sine x over x for you. There it is. That's sine of x over x. And do you see that the red and the blue create kind of like this funnel as you go out to the right? And it always stays in between. And so as I go out to the right, right, as I keep on going out to the right, it's just getting smashed in between there, right? Squeezed between those two functions. And those two functions are both headed to zero, which means that this has to go to zero. So that means our answer here is zero, right? Now this thing that I did over here actually has a name, okay? This thing is called the squeeze theorem. And what it says is that if you have some function, I'm going to write it over here on the side. Let me, let me write out what the squeeze theorem is. It says, suppose, just so you all know, that right there means suppose, all right? If you need to write that down somewhere. It's capital S with a little dash thing on the back side. Suppose, um, let's go g of x is less than or equal to f of x, which is less than or equal to h of x. So it's saying, suppose that you have three functions that all follow this string of inequalities. Over here, that would be, that would be um, this one, this one, and this one. Do you see this is like the g, the f, and the h? Right? Suppose we have some relationship between three functions like that. If the limit as x approaches a of g of x equals the limit as x approaches a of h of x equals some l. So this is saying that you got this inequality, and then what you do is you're taking the limit as x goes to something, whether it be the number 2 or infinity, it doesn't matter what it is. But let's just say that when you take the limit, the left side of this, that function, is equal to what happens here. All right? So for us, do you see that the left side went to 0, the right side went to 0? That's our L. right? Our L is what they both went to. If both of those go to L, then what must the middle one go to? L, L as well. So if this is true, then the limit as x approaches a of f of x must also equal L. That's the theorem. I, I think the theorem's a little bit easier to, to understand once you've seen it first, and then now you see it next to it, right? The hardest part of using this theorem, the hardest part, is you coming up with the three functions. Like here, this sine x over x, the, how did we come up with those three functions? I started with sine. I said it's between negative 1 and 1. I use that from pre-cal, right? That's not this. That, that's not the three functions. That's just a statement from pre-cal. To create the three functions, I divided everything by x, right? Now I've created the three functions, g, f, and h. The two n functions go to 0 when you take the limit as x goes to infinity, and thus the middle one must also do the same thing. All right? So this can be pretty tricky. So I've got a, I've got a major shortcut for you, OK, that you don't have to do this. All right? But it's, it would be, wouldn't be right for me to not talk about the squeeze theorem, at least. So here's the way I want you to think about this. If you're ever taking a limit, 
if you ever take a limit, it doesn't matter what x is going to, okay? It doesn't matter, who cares? And you have the top and you have the bottom, right? If you ever get bounded over infinity, your answer is zero. And it actually doesn't matter if your top or bottom, I mean, if the bottom is positive or negative infinity, it doesn't matter. Right, like this function on top sign was bounded, right, between negative one and one, and the denominator was getting huge. What happens in that case? Well, what we saw in this picture here, right? It gets squished down between two functions. So on a test, if you get something like this, and you, you get like, let's say, cosine x over x, right? Cosine x over x, that'd still be bounded over infinity, wouldn't it? So you just write bounded over infinity, equals zero, done. You don't have to do squeeze term. What if it's flipped? Is it still going to go to zero? Okay, yeah, good question. What if, it's, what if it's flipped? Let's try it. So what if it was this? Limit x goes to infinity of x over sine x, right? Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. Okay. Tricky, tricky question right here. This one, the top goes to where? Infinity, right? And then the bottom goes to, doesn't exist, right? But it's bounded, right? But there's a problem here. Because it's bounded, right? This is bounded, but doesn't it go through zero? Infinitely many times? So wouldn't this be undefined infinitely many times? Does that make sense? So you can't do a squeeze theorem on this one the way you can on the other one. You can't do anything on this. This actually, this limit doesn't exist. I can show you a picture. This particular limit does not exist. Let me show you what it looks like. X over sine X. Do you all agree everywhere that sine is zero, you're gonna have an asymptote? So what's happening here is that when you do this, do you all agree that the numerator is always positive? Always positive if we go to infinity? <clears throat> but the denominator is going, what, negative one, negative one, back and forth, right? And it's going through zero each time it does that. So every time it goes through zero, this is undefined. And then when it's below zero, you've got a negative output, and when it's above zero, you've got positive outputs, which is why you have all this shit happening here. It's crazy looking. Let me, let me squeeze it down a little bit. I'm trying to squeeze it down. Uh, let me graph the sine function just by itself. Whoa. That didn't work. Hard to see it. I'm going to zoom in over here. Everywhere that the sine function is zero, right, right there, that's where the sine function is zero. Notice we have a vertical asymptote right there. Right there, that's a vertical asymptote. Right, if we look at that graph, on the left side it goes to infinity, on the right side it goes to negative infinity, right? But see, the further we go out, this just keeps happening, right? Just keeps happening. So this limit would not exist. Good question. There's something subtle here, though. If I change this, answer, this right here, if I change my limit from going from infinity to, let's say, pi, from the right-hand side, now that you could answer. Because what is sine of pi? Sine of pi. What's sine of pi? Zero, so that's zero, right, over pi? Oh wait, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. Sorry, I meant to say this one. Oops, sorry, 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 pi here. So what happens is you go to pi. The top goes to pi, right, and the bottom goes to zero. That's a fixed number over zero, which means which means 
Positive infinity, negative infinity, or does not exist. This is what we studied last time, right? Okay. This is that other scenario. So maybe we should list out all of our scenarios, just to, so we kind of have what we've looked at so far. I agree. Can I move on? Did I answer this? Yes, this is yes. does not exist. This is does not exist. If you ever have bounded over infinity, the answer is going to be zero. If you have it the other way around, it's not. It's not zero. It's not one. It's it's most of the time it's going to be undefined. It could or does not exist. All right. <clears throat> so let's let's run through our little rolodex of what we what we've talked about. Zero over zero, right? That is bad, right? We got to do some algebra. What's the other one that we have to do algebra on? Infinity over infinity, right? We got to do algebra or some sort of trick. Algebra trick for both of those. Okay. Um, what about this? Fixed over zero. Well, that was the one where you could have infinity, negative infinity, or does not exist, right? That's what we studied last time. What about the other way around? What if it was zero over fixed? Your answer would just be zero. Now remember, when I say zero over fixed, fixed over zero, all of this that I'm talking about here is in the limit. Okay, when you're taking a limit of something, you're getting this you're getting this sort of format happening, right? Um, also, how about infinity minus infinity? That's something we have to deal with here, some sort of algebra or trick, because we, we did factoring, didn't we? What else? Have we done anything else? Uh, how about this? We haven't done it, but let's just talk about it. What if you got zero over infinity? That should be zero, right? Because the, the, the top is like, hey, I want to get small, right? I want to get small, and then the denominator is like, well, we, guess what? I'm going to get big, which makes fractions smaller anyway, right? So doesn't that like they help each other out here? So this should be zero. What about, what am I missing? Um, how, about, how about infinity over fixed? And I'll flip it over, fixed over infinity. Did I do that one? No. So infinity over fixed. This should be infinity. And how about fixed, fixed over infinity? Zero. Now I'm going to do something real quick. I'm going to see if I'm still logged in here. I think I am. Let me go to our class, our class page. I'm going to go to files. And I'm going to go to formulas you can have on the exam. And there's something here called the limit summary. And I recommend you download this. And I'll just say you're welcome right now because most, most uh, students are not allowed to have something like this on a calculus test. Uh, thank you. Yep. So this is my summary of limits, basically everything I'm doing right now. So notice the, the top left. Um, let me zoom out so you can see what this file looks like. It's just a page with, that's it right there, okay? And it just shows you kind of like what the different scenarios are. So if you see zero over zero, or infinity over infinity, or do you see here infinity minus infinity? Those three scenarios, we're going to do some algebra or some trick, right? Do you see that there's a lot we have not done? We have not done zero times infinity. We haven't done run, one raised to the infinity, zero to the zero, or infinity to the zero. Stay tuned, it's coming, not till later though. All right, so we will revisit that. Zero over fixed is zero. Do we have that up here? Yeah, it's right there. Fixed over zero, any of these scenarios, it depends on whether or not it's positive or negative. But this is, this is the case where you either get positive infinity, negative infinity, or does not exist. That's fixed over zero. And then fixed over infinity, you get zero, that's uh, this one, all right? And then, yeah, I think that's it. That's pretty much like everything you need, right? All right, let's keep moving. Any questions? All right, 1.6 is over. We're done. We're going to move on. We're going into chapter two.
The idea of the limit, right? Everything we just done, this, I, this concept of the limit is the heart of calculus, all right? It is the absolute most fundamental part of calculus. You have to understand the limit. From the limit is born all of the other branches of calculus, all right? Everything is based upon this concept of the limit. That's what, that's what differentiates calculus from algebra and pre-cal, trig, is this concept of a limit. The idea of letting something get really close to something without actually ever being there, right? So from that, we can, we can build a bunch of stuff off of this. One of the things that we are going to build is this thing called the derivative. And the derivative is just one application of limits, okay? So it's one specific usage of a limit. And it turns out to be the most fundamentally important thing for Cal 1. So in Cal 1, we are really focused on this idea of a derivative. And then in Cal 2, there's the antiderivative, and then there's, you know, there's all these different things that can come out of this. All right, so we need to start talking about this. So 2.1, I'm wondering if I should bring up the notes. I'm gonna, yeah, I'll show you a couple of, I'll show you a couple of images over there first to start us out. So chapter two is called derivatives. The entire chapter is called derivatives, all right? 2.1 is called derivatives and rates of change. So I'm not gonna make you read this, but basically this says, okay, we've been doing limits. Now there's one specific thing we can do with them. Very special, there's a very special limit we're about to look at. And it's going to be um, born first from this concept that we talked about at the very uh, beginning of class, the idea of having, we started with the circle, that if you had a circle, you had two points on a circle, you had something called a secant line. But if we put the two points on top of one another, you created this thing called a tangent line. And everyone here seemed pretty comfortable with that idea, yes? And then I said, what we're gonna do later is we're going to take, we're gonna take a graph of some function and we're gonna take two points on that curve and we're gonna connect them with the line and we're gonna call that the secant line. And our main kind of objective is to slide the second point over on top of that first point to create this thing called the tangent line, right? That was where we wanted to go with this, right? And somehow that helped us talk about the speed of something at an instant in time. And you know, we talked about this in the very beginning. So that's what I'm gonna do right now. We are going to see if we can come up with a general formula that it would allow us to take some second point on a function, slide it on top of the first point on that function, and create a tangent line. Can we do that in a formula, in some sort of formula manner for any function anyone ever gives us? Make sense? Like, do you get the basic geometric objective here? 